Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, apologies from uh, Virgin, who should have got me here earlier. Um, I, I've been asked to talk about energy storage. Now, yes, I, I do have a, a lot of background in the energy business, but I wouldn't say that storage is particularly my, my, my forte. I guess I've dabbled in various things, and uh, uh, one thing I do is, for example, give a, a lecture to undergraduates on batteries. Um, but that's from a, an electrochemical point of view, which is part of my, my background in physical chemistry. Um, what I wanted to cover very quickly, and there's an awful lot to this, are the different types, essentially the different types of energy storage, um, which are divided into thermal, mechanical, and chemical. And let's see if this thing works. Here. Yes. Um, I think we've already heard, uh, just coming in on the end of that conversation there, a little bit of the needs of energy storage, which ranges um, from uh, small scale storage of you know, a few watts or, 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 or even less um, to multi megawatts. Um, and from a utility point of view, uh, there, are, there are various needs or, or, or um, yeah, well needs, needs for energy storage, certainly in terms of supporting the system whether that's on the short term, um, to, for example, overcome dynamic faults, short circuits, things like this, to slightly longer scale, where you're trying to cope with uh, inter intermittent supplies, um, for example, from wind and solar, and this is where the integration of, of storage with the renewable energy comes in, um, when you really want a, a diurnal storage or something that will take, take the, take the uh, power that's generated during the day from the, from the sun and store it so you can use it overnight, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's uh, a requirement for peak shifting. There's a lot of discussion going on in Europe at, about that at the moment and the, the way that uh, uh, utilities can work together in this area. Um, economic advantages in terms of if you can store energy, maybe you can avoid building extra power lines and, and uh, uh, extending the, the power distribution network. Um, then, so that, so that in terms of uh, storage, there are two dimensions. There's the dimension of time, in other words, how long do you want to store for, and the dimension of um, uh, scale, size. So from that we have the domains of application, and, and I apologize, uh, this is not uh, my original slide, it came from Hatch, who are big in energy storage. Um, and this lists, uh, or plots, the power requirements for utility applications ranging from, as I said, just a small, uh, a few watts or kilowatts uh, in utility terms up to uh, 100 megawatts. And then uh, that's along the bottom, then up the, 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 the uh, uh, x-axis you've got storage time, which in this case ranges from uh, milliseconds uh, up to uh, a thousand minutes. I would like to extend that, extend that even further, um, and that's because I think that's where hydrogen comes in, which is one of my kind of um, things at the moment, so I'll talk about that in a little while. In terms of the technologies, uh, this slide shows a number of them and where they kind of fit into this map. Um, many of them you'll be very familiar with. Uh, they're acid batteries in every car. Um, there are various advanced batteries and I can go through a whole re range of batteries from uh, um, sodium sulfur, lithium uh, batteries, nickel metal hydrides and so on. Super caps, you'll be hearing a lot more about those in the future. Um, and then there are things that are kind of interesting but never really applied too much, like flywheels. Um, the cheapest, by far, are the, com the, the mechanical storages, compressed air and pump storage. So let's, let's just go back and, and look at the um, means of thermal storage. Thermal storage is basically storage of heat. And you can store heat in a number of different materials, um, most commonly in water. Uh, it's very low energy density, um, and it's more suited to high power applications than most others. Phase change materials are quite interesting because they can be uh, made at particularly high energy densities um, and high temperatures up to, considering that's not my slide, I don't know where 64C came from, but it must be more like 640 degrees C. The research is ongoing in that area. Um, most common materials for phase change materials are um, molten salts and they're widely used. This is an example of a, a system, uh, a phase change material. You're aware that when a material changes phase, whether it's going from um, liquid to, uh, to solid um, or, or liquid to gas, then there's a latent heat 
and that latent heat is quite substantial. And so people make use of that latent heat um, to uh, store energy in the material once the phase has changed. Here's an example of molten salt storage that's used with a, a solar system, a very large solar system that was proposed in the, uh, um, in the States a few years ago. And a number of these are now appearing. In terms of um, the mechanical storage, the one that you're probably most familiar with, of course, is the pumped hydro. Uh, widely used, um, very cheap. There's a lot of examples in Australia, but unfortunately, um, most um, opportunities to use pumped hydro storage are, are, are now pretty well taken up. Probably more interesting these days is compressed air storage, which is a very simple concept. Um, and people are talking about using um, underground caverns for storing compressed air, or even um, uh, some of them coming out of sequence here. That's an example of pump storage, which, as I said, you're all, I'm sure, familiar with in terms of um, uh, hydro schemes. Here's the compressed air storage. Um, usually uh, underground caverns, but more recently we're seeing examples of people using um, uh, balloons, if you like, very large balloons that are subsea. Uh, and using those to store, um, store compressed air. One um, issue with that is that when you're c compressing uh, air, there is in fact an energy um, penalty in terms of temperature. The if you're, if you're, if you're um, recovering the, the energy for the compressed air, and I hadn't realized, in fact, I'm still not sure of this, but I heard the other day in England um, that this is a quite substantial parasitic loss uh, in, in uh, compressed air, air storage. I'm, I'm really surprised about that. If anybody can actually throw any light on that, I'd be interested in the reason for it. Um, going on to batteries, well, as I said, there's a, a wide variety of batteries, and, and they can be used for a number of applications. And I was reminded earlier on when I was looking at the time um, that my watch uses a battery, and most people use a battery watch these days, but a few years ago we always used a mechanical storage it's called a spring. Um, so there are opportunities, I still think, for using a lot of mechanical storage. But in terms of batteries, uh, the, the cheapest by far is probably the lead-acid battery, which has been around for a long time. Um, and my colleague, uh, uh, David Rand, uh, has been telling me all about the history of the lead-acid battery, which still continues to develop. Um, uh, a few weeks ago, I had a problem with my own car battery, and uh, the guy from the... Uh, RAC said, oh, this is a calcium battery, I can't charge that up. And I said, what do you mean it's a calcium battery? It's a lead acid battery. Well, I now know it contains calcium for very good reasons. The point there um, is that a lot of the battery chemistries are, are, are quite complex. Um, and when we talk about, for example, the advanced um, lithium battery, um, there are various uh, types of lithium battery coming, coming along now. The most exciting one that I heard um, last week when I was in the UK was the lithium air battery, which apparently has the potential for much, much higher power densities than the conventional lithium battery. Um, and um, there are some technical issues with it, but um, if they can make the cathode using carbon nanotubes rather than conventional manganese dioxide, then it's fantastic. Anyway, the point, of, uh, sorry, the point about the, the batteries is that not only they can be used for a variety of applications over a variety of scales, but also the applications include uh, cars, and we're hearing an awful lot about electric mobility these days, um, and some of these advanced high power densities batteries will be used, no doubt, in, uh, in, in electric vehicles, whether they're battery electric vehicles, sometimes known as um, what's it, uh, emissions elsewhere vehicles, um, <laughs> and uh, on, the, on the basis that most of the power comes from fossil fuel, and just, so you're just burning more fossil fuel to feed your electric battery. Um, but uh, no, the, uh, the, the, the other thing with the, the battery uh, vehicle is that it can, if you have a plug-in hybrid, um, and ultimately, uh, most of the automakers are saying that the, 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 the future to be a battery um, fuel cell hydrogen vehicle, and maybe we can discuss that later. And then, of course, batteries are used for um, stationary power, uh, not only at the larger scale for overcoming things like spinning load, as I mentioned earlier, but also particularly for remote area power supplies. And this is where I see a, a great opportunity for some of these um, novel battery technologies, and indeed some of the 
older batteries, like the Edison uh, nickel iron battery, which is a pretty cheap uh, and rugged um, uh, machine. The other thing that uh, you can use for some of the, these um, utility storage is something called the flow battery. Uh, I'm sure some of you will have heard of the, um, the vanadium battery. That's a particular Australian uh, brand, if you like, of flow battery. It's been around for a number of years now. It's been um, commercialized in, in Japan. There are a number of others. Um, Red Flow in, uh, in Queensland is developing a zinc bromine battery. Um, and all of these basically work uh, in a similar way. The a conventional kind of lead acid battery, if you like, um, is a rechargeable battery. Uh, and what happens when you discharge it, of course, is the, the uh, essentially you get um, reactions on either, either electrode, which, um, uh, which dissolve, if you like, or, or react the electrodes. And then when you reverse and charge the thing up, then you get reverse reactions going on. In the case of the flow battery, you're taking that um, electrolyte, or sorry, electrode, and you're making it mobile. And in the case of this one, which is an example of the vanadium battery, um, the electrochemical reactions, uh, which are redox reactions, change the oxidation state of each of the, the, uh, the two fluids that are on, the, uh, on either side of the cell. And by simply um, changing the oxidation state and then transferring that material into a, into a store, then effectively you're storing the, 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 the power. And what you do then is reverse the flow and recover the power. Um, ideal for large scale power systems, um, not particularly efficient, uh, but, but uh, good for, um, as I say, for large scale power. Um, and then that leads on to hydrogen, which is kind of my own particular area. Um, I didn't want to say too much about it because it's probably come out in discussion. Um, but here's an example of um, hot off the press, as you might say. Griffith University in, in Brisbane is setting up a, uh, a new building, a renewable energy building. Um, and one thing they're doing, and they're asking me to help them, uh, is to use a PV array to electrolyze water in a PEM electrolyzer to produce hydrogen, which then they're going to store in a novel stationary storage medium, which I guess I can't really say much about, not because I can't, but because I don't really know. Um, th this is something that Evan Gray has, has been uh, developing at the university. And then the idea is that once the hydrogen is stored, um, then that can be recombined with oxygen from the air in a, in a PEM fuel cell to regenerate uh, hydrogen, uh, to, sorry, to regenerate electricity. The, the problem with this type of thing is uh, that the efficiency, the round trip efficiency is pretty low. Um, electrolysis is fairly efficient, 80, 90% maybe. Um, fuel cell, 40% if you're lucky. Um, so overall, you only get something like 30%. But in some, some instances, that's, that's uh, actually not, a, not, a, not an issue. Um, <clears throat> and to finish with, and I was told to be quite short, um, here's a list of the, the main um, types of stories that I've covered. Uh, you probably can't read all the writing. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, but the reason for putting it up was to um, show the difference, differences in range of price or capital costs rather of these uh, uh, different items. So for example, you'll see um, the, the pumped hydro uh, coming out at uh, between three, well around about $3,000 a kilowatt. Um, compressed area storage, compressed air storage, much less as you can imagine. If you've if you basically got a large cavern, um, that's the only cost. The only cost is pump and uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the compressor to recover it. Um, batteries vary indeed in, 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 uh, in costs. The sodium sulfur one, um, much beloved of some nuclear uh, people, is uh, relatively cheap compared with some of the others. Um, I didn't really want to cover anything like the superconducting magnetic energy storage. Um, I keep hearing lots of novel and interesting ideas of, of uh, uh, storage systems that are really very experimental. I heard of a nuclear one the other day, which um, sounds uh, interesting, um, where they're, they're trying to uh, store the energy of, um, or store energy in a nuclear reaction. So it's actually not a nuclear power, but it's using a, a novel uh, nuclear reaction to, to store energy. Um, I doubt that we're going to hear much about that. Um, in the next 10 years or so. I think there's a lot of things to go on before, we, before that materialises. But I, I hope that's just an introduction. I hope that that will lead to some interesting discussion. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, we'll start off myself or Glenn will ask you a few questions and then we'll open it up for general discussion to the audience. Um, a lot of the, the discussion um, from both speakers to date um, has focused on sort of fine scale management and small scale storage and so on. You did talk a bit about um, pumped hydro and compressed air and so forth. Um, what do you see are the, are the ultimate limits to, to building a sort of storage capacity if we were to go to a, a really high penetration of of variable energy sources like, like solar and wind. I mean, is it conceivable and at what price would it be to, to store a day's worth of energy for the entire electricity grid, or two days or a week's worth? Um, at what point is it just not worth it and we need to go to other methods? Gee, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting question. I think there's, there are lots of questions in, in, in that. Um, the, uh, I mean, as I've said on that last slide, the the simple costs, the upfront capital costs of these, these systems do vary quite a lot. Um, and whilst some will be attractive for large scale and some will be attractive for small scale, it's very difficult to, to, to generalize. Um, as I said uh, earlier on, the pumped hydro is well proven, well established, um, but it's difficult to find locations where you can actually use that for, for new systems. Um, so uh, I think that's well established and understood, and maybe that, that's it, and cheap. Um, some of the more advanced systems, uh, uh, and let's go straight to hydrogen, and the, the reason I, I guess that I think that it's, that's um, got some merits. Uh, I mentioned that it's not particularly um, efficient, uh, but on the other hand, for remote area systems, you have to consider a number of things. You need to consider uh, the cost of um, the cost of providing fuel for uh, a remote area power supply, uh, and more often than not, that's that's diesel, which has to be shipped to the point of use, and so there's a, a cost involved in that. Um, the second thing is, if you for a remote area system, you're inevitably going to be using an intermittent renewable source, whether that's a wind or, or solar. Um, you can store that power in lead acid batteries, which if all you're interested in is having overnight storage, maybe. Um, but if you're storing anything more than that, uh, then the lead acid battery is not very good because it degrades. There are issues in terms of you know, recycling of the environment. Um, there are no issues in terms of the, the environment with hydrogen, uh, which is a good way of storing energy over the longer term. Um, and the more people I talk to, the more say uh, this is where this is going to come into its own uh, for, for stationary power. I think with, for, for vehicles it's a different story. Um, and the, the issue with, again, with hydrogen, as with compressed air, is potentially it could be quite cheap. Okay, the, <coughs> the, the fuel cell and the electrolyzer are very expensive at the moment, but the system itself need not be that expensive. And we're talking about a, a very common uh, material of hydrogen. So um, I would, I would you know, put my um, look at my crystal ball, and you know, maybe 15, 20 years away, then hydrogen will be more more seriously considered than it is now. In the meantime, I think that a, a lot of the battery technologies will um, will develop. Uh, we are already seeing a huge uptake in lithium batteries, um, and with the with the lithium uh, air battery that I saw last week. Uh, got terrific potential. That, that could overtake most of the other technologies. 